Okay, hello everybody. Welcome back to our next talk in the phylogeography, a growing belief symposia. I'm very pleased to present to our next speaker, Dr. Anne Joder from Duke University. She is going to give us a talk about investigating patterns of creative speciation in responses to environmental change in Madagascar mouse lemur. She is going to receive questions only in English and respond only in English. So if you have any question, please use the chat. Now, Dr. Anne, please take over. Okay, I hope everybody can see uh, my screen. And I want to start by thanking the organizers and just expressing my incredible um, admiration of this entire project. It's really been wonderful to be part of and to hear these wonderful talks. Um, but I've, I have a lot of slides, so I better get moving. Um, I'm gonna take a slightly different approach than the talks that I've been hearing. One thing, we're going across the planet uh, to the old world, to Madagascar, and rather than take a sort of a big view overview of phylogeography, I'm just gonna jump in with the um, assumption that everybody is up to speed on uh, the, the science of phylogeography. And we're going to look specifically at mouse lemurs. Um, so I'll start by uh, just reminding everyone that Madagascar is one of the Earth's hottest biodiversity hotspots. Uh, something on the order of 80 to 90% of the species are endemic across all groups. Um, so it's a very special place, but it's also very uh, severely threatened by human impacts. So the forests are disappearing rapidly and it is a very complicated problem because it's one um, really driven by poverty and political corruption, I'm sad to say. Um, so we have species populations and their genomes that are vanishing before our very eyes. And it's ironic that I'm someone who is interested in studying the past of Madagascar, but the future looks very uncertain and the data are, you know, I mean, beyond other concerns about loss of biodiversity, we're losing data on the evolutionary process. So I, I do feel like we're a bit um, in a race against the clock. And I know this is true in the neotropics as well. So we're all in this uh, battle together. Um, so as I said, I'm going to focus on mouse lemurs. And this is a group of, of lemurs that I I uh, started working on about 20 years ago, and it was really as a side project, but as I was telling the organizers, every time we would conduct a study, the, you know, we would get some answers, but we would get more questions than answers, so it's really been this sort of engine of fascination um, about these creatures, and we, we're trying to think of them sort of as a developing model uh, for understanding cryptic speciation, and I, I hope I'll convey that in my talk. Um, so just to give you a little background, uh, for, from the years of 1973 to 1993, there were only two species recognized um, of mouse lemurs. One that's the gray mouse lemur in the sort of dry forests of Western Madagascar and another that was called the Rufus uh, mouse lemur that was in um, the Eastern rainforest. So very different habitats, uh, opposite sides of the island. And this uh, taxonomy persisted for quite a long time. Um, until I uh, became involved with um, some of my colleagues and, uh, you know, we, we sort of helped accelerate this uh, species deline delineation uh, process. Um, so let's see if I can get this to go. Um, so this is a study that, you know, this was my first uh, foray into mouse lemur diversity and it was a pub uh, paper published in PNAS in the year 2000. And one, you know, we, there were sort of two major observations, one being that there was much more phylogenetic diversity than um, any of us expected, and also that the phylogeographic patterns uh, did not fit um, our assumptions about this east-west um, divide. Um, and for me, that was really problematic and I struggled with that. And then I finally had to admit, okay, um, so we were just wrong. Um, and so let's, let's move further and, and see, you know, dig into this a bit. Um, but jumping ahead, um, over the course of the past 20 years, uh, really actually kind of starting with uh, our big study in 2000, 
uh, people have been working in Madagascar, collecting mouse lemurs, uh, sampling their DNA, and it largely uh, it's been mitochondrial DNA, sort of almost DNA barcoding, and there's been an explosion of recognized species, and we're now up to about 25. And um, so this, of course, raises uh, quite a few questions. Um, among them are, are these actually different species? And um, if so, how can we tell, um, especially when one is agnostic about species concepts. And one of my, I believe it was uh, Fabio, um, who was asked about uh, species concepts and gave a very eloquent uh, response to, to the, the problem, uh, the, the complexity of, of understanding species and species limits. Um, so, but let's say we do recognize uh, these species. Next, we want to know what is driving or has driven uh, lineage diversification and you know if they are uh, diverged and have become uh, different species uh, however we want to uh, define that what's maintaining their lineage diversification is it biology that you know uh, some form of reproductive isolation or is it ecology or is it some combination of the two? Um, and in cases of reproductive isolation, are the mechanisms pre or post zygotic or some mix of the two? These are all questions we have yet to answer uh, despite, despite the fact that I've been working on this uh, clade for uh, 20 years um, and I'm really wanting to get to the bottom of it. Um, so we're fortunate in the sense that we have some natural uh, laboratories for studying speciation and mouse lemurs. There are uh, seven uh, documented areas in Madagascar where multiple species occur and overlap in sympatry. So we can uh, look at patterns of gene flow and look at microecology. And, you know, there are a lot of things that we can do in these little natural laboratories. But the problem is these animals are endangered. They're nocturnal. They're tiny. Um, they also hibernate part of the year. So it's really uh, very challenging to collect just basic data on these animals. Um, so one of the things that we've done is we've formed something that we call the RADSEEK Consortium. These are my colleagues that I won't, uh, I don't have time to name, but Jordi Salmano uh, was the, the sort of innovator of this. And we decided to combine all of our samples and use the same uh, methodologies to generate a homologous RADSEEK data. So at this point we have over, um, this is an old slide actually, so we have over um, 300 individuals from across about 20 species and with really good geographic coverage. So we can we can apply these data and have some consistency of results in these different laboratories, uh, natural laboratories. So what I'm going to do um, is with the rest of my time is I'm going to tell you two quick stories, I hope quick, um, of you know, some of the ways that we're uh, looking at these data. And this is actually not a, a project out of the consortium, but it was one um, that was published in 1996. And we were, were interested in this connection between the East and the West Coast. Um, so it all began, and if you'll just bear with me for a minute, we're gonna zoom in on the central plateau that was called the Highland Plateau of Madagascar, which looks like um, a wasteland. Um, and you see these sort of look like riverine forest uh, areas that are all throughout the, the Highland Plateau. And the, the spot that I just showed you is a, a little place called Ankafu Bay. And uh, my colleague Marina Blanco collected some mouse lemurs there and we looked at their genetic diversity and were astonished to find really deep uh, patterns of genetic diversity in this tiny little spot um, in the Highland Plateau. So that um, inspired the study and um, just to you know, orient you, it was basically collected right here. So we uh, uh, analyzed um, these samples in the context of all these RADSEQ data to try to understand where they fit in with uh, other parts of the mouse lemur radiation. And this figure um, is uh, uh, generated by um, uh, a program called Space Mix. Um, uh, Graham Coop, uh, his lab, uh, produced the software. It's really fantastic um, if you're interested in these things because what it does is here's your sample. This is the actual site where you collected it, but it shows you this sort of uh, probability bubble of where the geographic origins of 
um, the genotype would be. So what you see here, there are two big uh, take homes from this slide is one, you see this pull from the east to the west, implying that the, the west is sort of the ancestral um, uh, area of geographic or genetic diversity. And then here are all of these um, little forest fragments, and it makes it look like these fragments have been um, fragmented for a very long time. And that's a big controversy in Madagascar um, and among, amongst Malagasy investigators right now is how old are these grasslands in um, the central plateau? And you know, from these data, it looks like a rather old. Um, so in any event, um, what you know, to get to the question of are these good species? Uh, one of the species that we looked at is just something called Microsepus birthday. This is what their habitat looks like. It's on the uh, dry west coast. And then their sister uh, lineage is way over here on the eastern side of Madagascar in the rainforest. So uh, very, very different habitats, very different geographic distributions, yet they are each other's closest sister in this big phylogeny of, of 25 or more uh, lineages. So I think that's uh, fairly good uh, evidence that at least there's been ecological speciation. Um, of course, we wanted to be able to try to put some dates on this. This is what the phylogeny looks like. So this here's a species here in this green, um, which is called my Microsepus maxinus. Here is this little uh, species, Microsepus birthday, and then here is Rufus over here on the on the eastern coast in the rainforest. And it looks like that split occurred about fifty thousand years ago. So that's pretty recent um, in mammalian speciation. And there are another couple of interesting points: is that the the eastern and western uh, these two uh, species are each other's sister to the exclusion of Myaxenus, which is just to the north of Berthe. Um, so that's that's rather interesting. And, and also, uh, mouse lemurs are cryptic uh, species, and you'll see more about that in a moment. Um, but this little Berthe is the, <laughs> the one mouse lemur species that is quite morphologically distinct. It's about half the size of other mouse lemurs and comes in at a big 30 grams. I mean, it you know fits right in the palm of your hand. Um, so the two major take-homes from this story are that the geographic, ecological, morphological, Presumably, reproductive isolation distinctions have evolved in uh, less than or around 50,000 years ago, which is not very long ago for a mammal. Um, and the Cirabina River that I pointed out appears to be a more effective biogeographic barrier than the Highland Plateau, which was, uh, again, a big surprise uh, to us when we were looking at these uh, results. Now quickly to move on into the second story, um, we're now focusing very uh, intensively on the uh, southeastern part of Madagascar, where there are five lineages and possibly even six that are uh, evolving in independently in this one isolated region of Madagascar. And this is, oh, sorry. Um, this is just to show you that these really are cryptic uh, mammals. They, they look very much alike. So this uh, species and this species are at their last uh, common ancestor is the most recent common ancestor of the entire radiation. And yet they look virtually identical. Um, and ecologically, as far as we can see, they seem to be doing the same things. Um, so we're quite puzzled about what, what is happening here and we're, we're trying to look into that. Um, now, as far as their uh, habitat goes, it's really, this is a fascinating area of Madagascar and it's critically threatened uh, right now. So again, racing against the clock. Um, so we have humid rainforest. This is shown in the green. Um, we have dry spiny forest. This is shown in this sort of <laughs> ugly yellow color. And then we have these amazing uh, patches of literal forest. This is sort of these sandy soil forests that cling to the coast and they're disappearing before our very eyes. And just to point out that one of this uh, species, putative species is found only um, in these literal forests. So um, highly threatened once the literal forests are gone, so is this species. Um, now, 
we're building on work uh, that has been uh, conducted by my colleague in Germany at University of Hamburg, Jörg Ganshorn. Um, he had two students publish work um, back in the you know 2009-2011 um, uh, uh, time frame, and they used microsatellites to look at the parental species and uh, putative hybrid zones, and they recognized with these data they were convinced that they were seeing F1 hybrids um, um, and very distinct hybrid zones between the two parental species. Now we've gone back in with our RADSeq data and what this is, I, you know, to move through it quickly, there are two localities that were uh, resampling essentially with our RADSeq data and the triangles show you these putative hybrids um, and different colors show you the putative parentals. Um, here they are truly, you know, on top of each other and true syntopy. Here it's sort of more micro allopatry, um, but yet you see these, uh, with the microsatellite data, you see these putative hybrids. Now when we, um, now I'm going to step back for a bit. So we've, you know, applied our RADSeq data to look at this. And this is this sort of um, uh, micro allopatric uh, site. And so if you look at this as a naive, I'm sure the botanists are already, you know, picking out a lot of different microhabitats, but as a mammologist, you look at this and you think, hey, that looks uh, pretty uh, homo homogeneous. But if you really look closely, you can see these gallery forests right here along uh, this little river basin. And according to Jorg, um, you only see Grisio rufus in sort of the more dry area, and you only see murinus here on the, um, in the wet forest uh, near these little river, riverine um, areas. And the, the thing about so is they're highly sensory organisms. Um, they communicate with olfaction and with uh, with uh, vocalizations, much like uh, birds would do. Um, so they're certainly within sniffing distance. So it doesn't seem like there's any um, you know particular barrier that would uh, prevent uh, reproductive interaction. Yet when we resampled the hybrids and the parental species with the RADSeq data the hybrids disappeared. Um, so the putative hybrids all turned out to be one parental species or the other, uh, which implies uh, complete reproductive isolation by what mechanism we do not know. And that's where we're, <laughs> we're just dying to find out what it is, whether it's prezygotic, postzygotic, some combination of the two. Um, and also, you know, I promised in the title that I would try to tie this in with uh, climate fluctuations. And so what you see is that these two uh, putative parental species apparently have evolved reproductive isolation in the last 80,000 years or so. And also very interestingly, this most recent uh, divergence into these three lineages um, is almost precisely coincident uh, with the last glacial maximum. So it definitely looks like it's been a climatic, uh, you know, pump or, you know, the species pump that um, was discussed earlier in the symposium. Um, so the unifying theme here is that a lot can happen to a mouse lemur in a short period of geological time, especially in response, it seems, to climate change. Um, so it looks like a situation of allopatric speciation and then stochastic reconnection in sympetry in these various uh, areas of Madagascar. So we're trying to find out what's going on. Um, I, I, just to wrap this talk up, it's, we're almost to the end here. Um, as I said, these are cryptic animals. And so it's not entirely obvious which species you're looking at when you even when you have it in hand. So we've been doing DNA, DNA barcoding with mitochondrial uh, cytochrome B locusts. And to do so, we've actually been doing this in the field. Um, this work is being led by Marina Blanco, who I mentioned earlier, and her wife, uh, Lydia Green, who is a specialist in microbiome studies. And so they've been using Oxford Nanopore and mini PCR to set up mobile labs and bringing Malagasy students into the enterprise. Um, so it's on the ground training and it's also um, immediate identification of which species one is looking at. Um, so this has morphed into this really wonderful transfer of knowledge. Um, 
via these workshops. And I want to um, uh, give a shout out to Ashil Rasilimana, who was a postdoc in my lab at Yale, actually, and Fidia Soa Rasam, Rasambiana Rivo. He goes by Fidi Ross, um, not surprisingly, and Marina and Lydia. Um, so this is really an exciting opportunity to bring genomics into the field and also to engage Malagasy students and scientists in the enterprise. Um, so that's where I'll land. And I just want to, I mean, I, I always say it takes a village to study mouse lemurs because it's such um, <laughs> complicated work and Madagascar is not an easy place to get around. Um, so I won't, you know, read every name here, but there's the RADSEEK Consortium, there's the wonderful students and postdocs in my lab, and then all of our field collaborators, uh, almost all of whom are Malagasy, and our funding um, agents. And um, with that, I will conclude and take any questions that you might have. And thanks again so much for having me. No, thank you, Dr. Ann. It is really wonderful. I, I already told you that I love your study object. <laughs> it's so cute. Uh, well, you, uh, I invite you all to write any kind of question that you have. I have one. Uh, okay. Now. Uh, do you think that being cryptic species like uh, you should focus on extrinsic factor to determine the evolutionary history or are intrinsic factors also important? Oh, that's a wonderful question. And as I mentioned to you, we're trying to get the funding to do the work. And so, and it, we want to take a two pronged approach, in fact, to look at ecological factors and sensory communication, movement ecology. Are they even in the same space at the same time? I mentioned very briefly that these animals can torpor or hibernate. So there's this very, uh, you know, there's a sort of stochastic element of when they might be um, you know, hibernating. So there could be a temporal offset and their reproductive, it's, and their reproductive time is extremely limited. It's like a week um, per year. And if they fail in that first time, they can come back into a second estrus, but it's like, it's a really hit or miss with the reproductive season. They are probably not using visual cues. They're you know, almost certainly using olfaction. And the males actually have different uh, advertisement calls to attract the females. So it's sort of like the songbird analogy. So there's that, those are the extrinsic um, considerations, but there's also the genomics of it. And, you know, they have their, um, their diploid uh, chromosome number is 66. So they have lots of these tiny little acrocentric uh, chromosomes. And the, you know, so we don't even know. Um, yet we now have the, the ability with the you know, long read sequencing and Oxford Nanopore to really get the genomic signal figured out. So we, <laughs> we're, right. we want to throw the book at it and see what it is. Let's hope that phone comes. So we have uh, some uh, questions. It says from Melen, it says, how are these species identified today? Are there some small morphological differences? Do you think the amount of species uh, was overestimated before this result? Oh, that's a great question. And it's an ongoing, um, it's an ongoing question. And so what, you know, if this were an hour long talk, I would have, you know, gone through more of these little case studies, but it's really remarkable. And so we, we use a lot of um, multi-species coalescent modeling to look for patterns of gene flow so that that is our proxy for whether or not uh, the organisms are you know, reproductively um, active with each other. And, you know, and so I'm not really a biological species concept person because it's too absolute, but certainly reproductive isolation or, you know, progressive, you know, reproductive isolation, I think is a very strong um, signal to indicate that speciation is occurring. And in multiple places in Madagascar, we see these little, you know, tiny little radiations in situ and with very little to no evidence of gene flow in fairly recent um, geological time. So, so that's sort of an answer to the question. So I, 
I think probably, you know, there would be some argument available <laughs> to say these aren't good species, but, you know, certainly they're on their way to getting there. As far as the morphological um, indi indicators, I think Marina, for example, my Argentinian colleague, she can hold one in her hand and she she can read a lot into what she sees that you know a naive investigator can't see. So I do think there's some subtle subtle cues like body weight a little you know a little grayer, a little redder, you know that sort of thing. But certainly to a naive in, uh, investigator, not helpful. Um, so does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Another in, in work, and <laughs> um, we have one last that is. What is the influence of river in speciation in Madagascar? Oh, the rivers. Yeah. So actually, that's a great question. If, you know, from a phylogeography perspective, there is a very, um, uh, I don't know if I would call it well accepted model, but certainly well publicized model. It was published in science, um, you know, probably 20 years ago, that it looks like these riverine basins are, you know, sort of these uh, speciation pump areas so that during periods, because as everybody knows, you know, glaciation wasn't really an issue in, you know, the, you know, Africa, and Madagascar, but certainly the, the sort of cycle of cool and dry versus warm and wet would have created these, you know, pulses of forests, you know, spreading out and then contracting. And the idea being that they would contract up to the top of the mountains or to higher elevations. Um, so there's, a, you know, this very complicated model, but that's also rather elegant, that suggests that, you know, this pumping up and down between these river basins would have been a mechanism uh, to drive speciation. And the, 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 I mean, just, and then I'll stop. Um, the thing about the model is some organisms seem to fit that model pretty well, but a lot don't. <laughs> For example, the frogs don't at all. You know, the frogs seem to have been able just to, you know, hop over, um, you know, when the forests were contracted, but the mammals, you know, tended to get stuck. Um, so, yeah, it, yeah. definitely okay, rivers one. have played a role. <laughs> and we have the last one uh, that just came is as a beginner in the area, what are the impacts in the environment of these different but creative species? Um, I'm not sure I understood the question. You can read it if you want. I think. Okay, yeah. Let me, uh, yeah let me see. As a beginner in the area, what are the impact of the environment on these different? Oh, uh, so are you talking about environmental change at this point in time? Just, hmm. yeah. So um, I don't know. I, I don't really have a, an answer to the question. So the environment has certainly been. I think profound, you know, if we're talking about a mechanism that's driving the speciation, I'd, I'd say it's environmental to, as the sort of match that lights the fire. Um, but what keeps the fire going, I think, are these other issues that, that um, you asked about, Lara, like, you know, are they extrinsic or intrinsic? Um, so I think, you know, the, the match is the environment, the fire, keeps burning because of things that we yet don't know. Okay, so we learned that we have much to learn about this. Okay. <laughs> uh, we <okay>. do. <laughs> Thank you very much for the talk. Thank you all that uh, you're in the other side of the screen for, for watching the and Dr. Anne Schiller's talk. Uh, Happy Father's Day for your father. Yes. And yes. Please, uh, okay. all of you that are interested in the next talk, it will start just in a minute, if it has not already. That is from Agustina Ojeda. Uh, and you can enter that in the, in the link that is in Discord. And well, that's it. Thank you very much for your talk. Okay, Laura, thank you so much for your expert um, management of the talk. So oh, thank you. <laughs> and okay. thanks to everyone. Bye. See you.